Welcome back to the daily entertainment feed on Fiddler Music, with me as editor Olivia. Today, let's take a look at some breaking entertainment news in the past 24 hours. Thank you for always supporting and accompanying us. Come to the following hot news. House of the Dragon, will let you love, Game of Thrones again. The, House of the Dragon, Premiere Recap, A Bad Air Day. House of the Dragon, will let you love, Game of Thrones again. Many Game of Thrones fans are nervous about House of the Dragon's Sunday debut. There's no need to be, House of the Dragon is a winner. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. The opening moments of HBO's House of the Dragon see Viserys Targaryen inherit enormous responsibility when he's crowned ruler of the Seven Kingdoms. It's fitting that much of the show's first season, which debuts at 9 p.m. Sunday on HBO, revolves around a king struggling to live up to his predecessor. It's the precise burden shared by House of the Dragon itself, which has to follow one of the most celebrated TV shows of all time in Game of Thrones. Only time, and the subsequent seasons it brings, will tell if House of the Dragon can scale that imposing wall. But after watching the first six episodes, it's clear House of the Dragon at least has a shot. It's excellent TV, a fantasy drama that doesn't require Game of Thrones fandom to enjoy. Perhaps more importantly, House of the Dragon will give lapsed Game of Thrones fans reason to love again. That show's final season was controversial and polarizing. Where Game of Thrones ended up frenetic and at times unwieldy, House of the Dragon puts fans back on more steady, solid Westeros ground. The show starts 172 years before the death of the Mad King, Aerys Targaryen and the birth of Daenerys. Chronicling the peak and ensuing fall of the Targaryen dynasty, House of the Dragon is based on Fire and Blood, a volume of fictional history George R. R. Martin wrote on the Targaryens. Yep, Martin wrote a 900-page book on the Targaryens. Nope, we're never getting Winds of Winter. Much of Game of Thrones centered on the combative houses of Westeros vying to become the dominant clan. In contrast, House of the Dragon is all about the internecine conflict generated by different Targaryens all laying claim to the same Iron Throne. It begins with such a contest. In the opening minutes of House of the Dragon, following the death of Jaehaerys, the Great Council holds a vote on succession that pits Prince Viserys against his cousin, Princess Rhaenys. Viserys wins because the Lords of Westeros won't accept a woman as ruler. That doesn't stop him, later in the opening episode, from naming his daughter Rhaenyra Targaryen as his successor. Viserys was evidently a progressive guy for his day. But the situation is complicated when he remarries and his new wife gives birth to a son, Aegon. Viserys says the arrival of his son changes nothing, but an ominous question looms. If Viserys died, who in Westeros would support a woman's claim to the throne over a man's? The relationship between Viserys and Rhaenyra is a highlight, in large part because of the actors that portray them. Paddy Considine is strong in his role as a decent man turned average king, a fellow who struggles to balance the needs of his family and Westeros simultaneously. But the shining star of House of the Dragon's opening episodes is surely Millie Alcock as Rhaenyra. She's got an enchantingly expressive face. A simple squinting of the eyes or a pursing of the lips can betray the range of emotions that accompany King's court politics. You'll notice, if you peruse House of the Dragon's Wikipedia page, that Alcock plays, young Rhaenyra Targaryen, she's one of two people who play the character. Where Game of Thrones went wide, spreading its focus among different families throughout the continent, House of the Dragon goes long. There are gaps of time in between episodes that vary from months to years. That makes sense, since the book it's based on spans 300 years of history, compared to the much shorter time span depicted in Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire novels. Even after six episodes of the show, House of the Dragon's scope is still mysterious. It's clearly building to the Dance of the Dragons, a Targaryen civil war that's famous in ice and fire lore. But when it gets there, and how much further the show delves into the 172 years of history that separates it from Thrones, is tantalizingly unclear. The faster pace of House of the Dragon helps it feel different from Game of Thrones, which is helpful. Comparisons with Game of Thrones are unfair. Thrones was famous for complex characters, heartbreaking surprises and extravagant set-piece battles, each of which took years to build to. Fans who weren't disappointed by the show's controversial final season will have high expectations for House of the Dragon, and fans who were disappointed will demand something outstanding to win them back. But as unfair as those comparisons are, they're also inevitable. As the first episode of House of the Dragons finished, 
I asked myself whether it was as captivating as Game of Thrones first. I wondered if any character was as compelling as Ned Stark, or if politics within the King's small council would reach Littlefinger versus Varys levels of intrigue. That changed halfway through the second episode. Instead of reminiscing about the Starks and the Lannisters, I became entirely focused on the Targaryens. House of the Dragon may never be the next Game of Thrones but, from the six hours of scene, it looks poised to at least step out of the giant shadow its predecessor casts. That's an achievement any king, or queen, could crow about. The House of the Dragon, premiere recap, a bad air day. The Game of Thrones, spin-off tries to recapture the magic through nostalgic detail, family fights, and grisly scenes of childbirth. A new Game of Thrones show, in the year of our anxieties 2022, has arrived to ferry us away from our long winter of thrones, blessness. Do we want to go where it's taking us? House of the Dragon, HBO's lavish prequel series based on George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood, tells the story of House Targaryen in an era well before our old friends showed up. 172 years before the death of the Mad King. The opening titles inform us, and the birth of his daughter Daenerys Targaryen. Life in year 172 BDT, as I call it, looks familiar. Dusty colored cities and palaces, chandeliers that resemble bonfires, eerily toe-headed ruling families, the occasional orgy. Too occasional, perhaps, the show's ratio of violence to debauchery would do well to be adjusted. As ever, there's a succession crisis, and, when an HBO series is driven by a succession crisis, just sit back and observe the infighting. We've got hours of high-powered treachery to enjoy, or endure. Dragon, swiftly provides some of the old, Thrones, pleasures. The show opens not with a grim ice monster sequence, as Thrones, did. Hat tip to that. But with the announcement, in a grand hall, of Prince Viserys, Paddy Considine, as the next king. The action skips ahead, nine years into Viserys's reign, when, after a charmingly familiar credit sequence, no maps, just an amulet, and the comforting pounding of drums in classic Ramin Jawadi style, an aerial symphony of clouds and the flap of leathery wings bring us swooping over the Red Keep, in King's Landing. The King's teen daughter, the sharp-featured and extremely Daenerys like Rhaenyra Targaryen, Millie Alcock, has just borrowed the family car, a dragon named Cyrax, she dismounts with plucky nonchalance. Try not to look so relieved, she tells a grizzled old knight, tossing her blonde braid and removing her driving gloves. Every time that golden beast brings you back unspoiled, it saves my head from a spike, he replies. Ah, heads on spikes, how we've missed you, Westeros. Inside the palace, Rhaenyra and her friend Alicent Hightower visit the hugely pregnant queen. This discomfort is how we serve the realm, she says, proud and grim, and then Rhaenyra zips off to a meeting of the king and his advisors, where, as she pours water for them, undercover Arya style, she listens to the proceedings. Reports that begin, we've all been poring over the moon charts, a discussion of a pirate punishing madman called the Crabfeeder. Crustaceans are to this series as leeches were to Melisandre in Thrones, Revolting and Pivotal. The episode gives us glimmerings of interesting character development. Alcock does a masterly job of conveying Rhaenyra's intelligence and her conflicted position as a capable but underestimated princess. Considine gestures toward a Ned Stark-like warmth and strength, alongside mild regal ineptitude. He likes to postpone important decisions, and loves to tend to his massive sandcastle-like model of the city, pondering over it like a model train geek. There's a fleet of nostalgia-inducing details. The ridiculous, sword-crazy Iron Throne. A poetic young soul named Samwell. The majesty of soaring, roaring CGI dragons. Did they always sound so Wookiee-like? And it's hard not to love a show in which hundreds of flickering votive candles surround not rose petals in a proposal but a dragon skull the size of a Humvee. But, Dragon S world building lacks some narrative basics that could vastly improve it. Sparks of young love, intriguing or amusing unconventional friendships, well-planted seeds that bear appealing fruit. There's funny dialogue, but mostly of the unintentional variety. Laughing with your whores and your lickspittles, the king yells to a relative, in a rage. Tyrion Lannister he's not. That relative is Demon Targaryen, Matt Smith, Viserys's ambitious, ne'er-do-well younger brother. Like Rhaenyra, he's a dragon rider, not just anybody can pilot those things, and, also like her, he's a possible contender for the Iron Throne. 
the demon Rhaenyra dynamic, and demon's flaxen wig and eyes narrowed in constant scheming, recalls the Targaryens we know best. Daenerys and her brother, also named Viserys, whose death in thrones involved our rejoicing while he encountered a faceful of molten gold. Demon isn't as urgently repulsive, so far, but we get why nobody wants him to be king. His bad vibes orgies are just the tip of the bad vibes iceberg. King Viserys, meanwhile, wants what all kings want, a male heir. When his wife is in labor and he whispers, I love you, over her pregnant belly, we feel a prickle of unease. It's all about the baby, and it's starting to feel like the Tower of London around here. The show proceeds, with proud ham-fisted Ness, to juxtapose the childbirth scene with action sequences from a jousting match. Both reveal recklessness with lives in the pursuit of power, and not in a fun way. By the episode's end, the air problem still hasn't been resolved, and its dimensions have approached Shakespearean tragedy. Game of Thrones, for all its flaws, was a Sunday night treasure for a reason, its wild inventiveness and beauty, its overstuffed intrigue and action, its humor, its characters. It was also one of the last sparks of American monoculture, a phenomenon that managed to bring millions together, all at once, to eagerly discuss a scene or detail. Jamie waving goodbye to Brienne of Tarth, the emergence of a missing direwolf, the thrilling flight of a jerk through the moon door. The show began in 2011, carried us into the Trump years, provided welcome distraction, and ended in 2019, before the pandemic. It's hard not to approach, Dragon, not just with Thrones, nostalgia but with Before Times nostalgia. We want to summon the innocent escapism of those years, back when we reveled in Arya's face masks and Hot Pie's bread loaf. Will, House of the Dragon, have us obsessing about the crab feeder? Some tinkering would help its chances. Like the infamous final season of Thrones, Dragon, doesn't always make the most of its story's assets. Women, for example. Despite the glamour of Rhaenyra's dragon piloting, the show highlights the misery of its female characters more effectively than their individuality and spirit. The series' emphasis on succession results in childbirth scenes whose frequency, stay tuned, and howling agony is like a horror show spin on, Call the Midwife, another overlooked princess, Eve Best as Rhaenys Targaryen, whose eyes convey grim resignation, is nicknamed the queen who never was. Whether such characters deepen, or become more brightly defined, remains to be seen. In, Dragon, HBO has a precious legacy to preserve, a devoted fiefdom, and enormous pressure to not mess it up. Rhaenyra's voiceover tells us that the old king knew that, the only thing that could tear down the house of the dragon was itself. Ain't that the truth, king. And those are also the most outstanding news that closes the today morning thank you to everyone for listening and following Fiddler Music Daily News. If you find the video interesting and useful, please click like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the latest entertainment as well as celebrity news.